doctor of medicine. Tonight's story has the title, The World So High. Guardian of birth, healer of the sick, comforter of the aged. And the qualities of the worthy physician are three. The eye of an eagle, the heart of a lion, the hand of a woman. Our actual case history tonight concerns the field of aviation medicine. The object in point, something that most of us take for granted all our lives, the air around us. The case in point, William Clayton Roberts, a doctor of medicine who, in a sense, became his own patient. This story is based on factual reports and documents of the United States Department of Defense and is produced in cooperation with the United States Air Force, Aero Medical Branch. The year is 1943. 1943, the battle of the production line, the battle for superior equipment is being won. One great advantage in the air war is altitude, and America starts to produce planes that can attain superior altitude. Effective ceilings for fighters and bombers climb at an unprecedented rate, from a range in the 20,000s and mounting higher and higher into the substratosphere. And then something happens. Something happens, not to the planes, but to the minds and bodies that man the planes. So it continues. Whenever a plane in high altitude flight must be abandoned, something unexplainable happens to the men who bail out. They have the best parachutes, the best high altitude equipment, but they are being maimed and killed because somehow that equipment is failing them. And therein lies a story of courage, labor, and achievement by a group of men who bear the title Doctor of Medicine. How'd you feel when you bailed out? Fuzzy. Kind of fuzzy. I pulled the cord all right. That's when it happened. What happened? Don't know. Terrific. Like, like somebody hit me with a sledgehammer. How long were you unconscious? Do you have any idea? Don't know. I haven't any idea. Sorry, Colonel. So am I. Compound fracture, right leg, massive contusions, chest and shoulders. Severe anoxia. It's lack of oxygen. But he had oxygen. They all did. The ship supply and the emergency bailout bottles. Maybe he didn't have enough. It could have been a dozen things. What's your opinion? Haven't you any idea what's causing it? Dan, we don't know what's going on up there. It, it, it's like the other side of the sound barrier. You get up into the substratosphere, it's another world. Things happen. We don't know why. For the sake of those kids, somebody better hurry up and find out. You're the doctor. What do we need? Men equipping anything, but let's get on it. No, it's a stateside job, man. What can they find out in the States? It's right here we're losing the men. This is not a field project, man. It's something for a lab. We can't solve it here. Even the ones who come back like that kid, whatever it is, hits them so hard and so fast, they can't even begin to describe it. No, you, you take my word, man. I'm sure this is the way to move. OK, you sold me. Come on over to communications. How long do you think it would take them back there? I know half Arnold, not 10 seconds longer than it has to. Katie's taking her nap. 
Everything all right, huh? Uh huh. Now it is. Oh, you're fooling, Dad. You must have saw one enemy soldier anyway. No, I guess I was lucky, Jeff. You call that lucky? See what Ronnie and Katie are up to, will you, Jeff? Tell them to get in their pajamas, and Daddy will be in to say good night. Okay, Mom. Oh, you stick around, huh, Dad? A lot more things to ask you about. <laughs> well, how long do you think you'll be here? Any idea? Oh, for a while. I was lucky to be assigned to this base. At least I'm close to home. Can you tell me about the job? Well, I guess it's not too hush-hush. We're trying to check the effects of high altitudes on pilots and crews, things like that. And having quite a bit of trouble in combat overseas. Oh? Well, what's involved? Oh, lab work, mostly. Plod through the usual routine. I see. Well, suppose I put the kids to bed. Then we can relax and you can tell me all about it. I'll get it. Hello. Yeah, Colonel Roberts speaking. Yeah? Oh, I see. Uh, right. Bye. I gotta check into the base tonight, honey. Tonight? Yeah, this project's important. It's gotta move fast. I won't be long, okay? Doctor's wife. Well, I can't say Mama didn't warn me. Uh. Despite the fact it's his first night home with his family in almost two years, Dr. Roberts is ordered to check in at the base, where he meets the man who will be his chief assistant, Captain Carl Masterson, a doctor of medicine specializing in the field of internal medicine. And anything we don't have, we can pick up over at Boeing Field. They threw this together fast, but I don't think they did half bad myself. Seems to be a nice setup, very nice. I've been going over your reports and your personal notes, Colonel. I uh, hope you don't mind. Not at all. Glad you did. So, when do we start? First thing Monday? Well, I don't want to push you, Carl, but uh, how about first thing in the morning? Right? Good deal, Colonel. The following morning, the project is underway. Painstakingly, they lay a foundation from which Dr. Roberts and his assistants hope will stem the ultimate answer to the enigma. What is happening to the men who bail out at high altitudes? To begin with, selected personnel are given rigorous physical checkups with particular emphasis on respiratory and cardiac functions. Particular attention is also paid to the rate at which the bloodstream of each subject is able to accommodate to altitude. And first among the selected personnel, the guinea pigs, are Colonel Roberts and his assistant, Captain Masterson. Days later, another important observation is noted and forwarded to the proper quarters. Recommendations. All high altitude gear to be double checked for defects. Even the most brief exposure to the extreme cold of substratospheric altitudes can have severely injurious effects on the body. All personnel engaged in high altitude flight should be issued parachutes of nylon in preference to silk. Relative qualities of strength, together with other qualities of this material, together with the size of the parachute, lessens the severity of the opening shock and makes for markedly slower rate of descent. A decompression chamber, a specially designed tank in which the rarefied air of the substratosphere can be simulated. A complete electrocardiographic record is kept of the entire simulated flight, the object to reproduce the rarefied air conditions of an actual bailout, and to chart the reactions of the body. Painstakingly, Dr. Roberts and his assistant gather the facts of man's bodily reaction to the rarefied air at high altitudes with particular attention given to the respiratory functions. With the altitude in the decompression chamber at substratospheric conditions, Dr. Roberts and Dr. Masterson watch their human guinea pigs perform simple exercises, first with oxygen, then without oxygen. Their findings, less than 30 seconds after the oxygen supply is cut off, most men become incoherent and begin to lose their sense of coordination. For the crucial tests, doctors Roberts and Masterson undergo a final ground test simulating an actual jump from 40,000 feet. Testing oxygen. Oxygen on Okay, let's go. 
Simulated out at 40,000 feet. Dr. Roberts and his assistant make one of their most important discoveries to date. Report and recommendation. It is strongly advised that all personnel be instructed that their first, repeat, their first act of bailout procedure must be to go on emergency oxygen. Our tests reveal that at substratospheric altitudes, anoxia begins almost immediately. Total unconsciousness follows within 30 to 35 seconds for all emergency oxygen equipment is imperative. Present fitting, now in use, is likely to fall from subject's face when subject is in state of semi-consciousness or unconsciousness. Subject would then fail to recover sufficiently from anoxia effects to have the remotest chance of pulling parachute ripcord. This applies even at the lower altitudes. The above recommendations are considered most urgent. Finally, after weeks of thorough and intensive experimentation, one important task still remains. Confirm the truth of their findings. Someone had to make an actual jump, 40,000 feet above the Earth. Excuse me. Colonel Roberts. Yeah. Well, hi, sweetheart. What's up? Van Dorn. Well, where did he get in? Where is he? Out at the house, huh? Yeah, I'll, I'll be out in half an hour. Right, bye. <laughs> a test jockey, huh? <laughs> it's too bad they didn't transfer you sooner, Van. I might have had a job for you. I understand you're keeping your men quite busy. Wrapping right through, eh? We've come up with some pretty interesting things. You've read the reports. I keep them posted in my hat. You're doing a good job, Will. This thing can save lives. Save quite a few already. Say, uh... Who's going to do your jump? Jump? Well, I just figured it'd probably top it off that way. No? You bucking for the job, Van? <laughs> oh, I'm pretty well booked up. But if you're looking for a first-rate job, I'll consider it. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Colonel Roberts speaking. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I'll be right over. Got to go back to the base for a few minutes, honey. Now, you stay right here, Van. I'll, uh, I won't be long. Well, I don't know why. Relax, relax. I'll be right back. Bye, dear. The orders arrive from Washington. Plans are approved for the crucial test. A parachute jump for the first time from an altitude of 40,000 feet. Who's going to make the jump? The final decision lies in the hands of Dr. Roberts. I'm single. I'm more expendable. I insist that you reconsider me as a volunteer. Knock it off, will you, Carl? What do you want to do, go through channels? We haven't got time for that kind of a hassle. You know that. All right, Colonel. When do we set it up? Tomorrow. First thing in the morning.
Dr. Roberts prepares to embark on his journey. Not a very long one. A mere 16 miles. Eight miles up, eight miles down. A very memorable journey. For he will be the first human being to open a parachute at a height of 40,000 feet above the Earth. One of the first preparatory steps, an early morning game of volleyball. All the while Dr. Roberts exercises, he must utilize 100% oxygen continuously. By so doing, he eliminates all the nitrogen from his bloodstream, joints, and muscles. This lessens the danger of aeroembolism. Aeroembolism is very similar to the Benz or caisson disease, which oftentimes affects deep sea divers, sand hogs, and like occupations. Good luck, Colonel. Final preparations before takeoff. Dr. Roberts has helped him with the newest high altitude gear, much of it perfected by his own experimentation. A two-piece feather-lined suit for protection against the extreme substratospheric cold. Fatigue coveralls, sewn into them the emergency bailout oxygen bottles. An altimeter strapped on the left arm. Two parachutes, the standard backpack and an emergency chest pack. Finally, time for takeoff. Roberts is given a helmet equipped with earphones, and he now goes on the ship's portable oxygen bottle, the oxygen he will breathe until the jump. Garraway will fly Captain Masterson in a smaller plane capable of closely following the subject's descent. Also capable of a fast emergency landing at whatever spot the subject makes contact with the ground. Checklist during flight. Altitude, airspeed, temperature, oxygen supply. Tape line altitude, 40,200 feet. Airspeed indicated 100 miles per hour. Temperature indicated 49 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. Estimated effective temperature, corrected for airspeed, 79 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. Time, 12.33. Roberts checks the condition of the crew. Checklist for jump. One, disconnect headset. Two, walk back to Bombay and take position on platform. Three, have parachute static line attached to ensure immediate opening. Four, disconnect from portable oxygen supply and connect to emergency bailout oxygen bottle. Verify satisfactory operation. Hendricks to Garraway. Hendricks to Garraway. I'm ready for jump. How is your position? How is your position? Over. Garraway to Hendricks. Position OK. Over and out. Five open Bombay doors. Six. Hendricks to Garraway. He's made the jump. We're turning now to follow him down. So it happens in the early afternoon, the 24th day of June, 1943. Hendricks to Garraway. We can see him clearly now. He's unconscious. No sign of life. He should be down at your level in about eight minutes. You'll be able to follow him closer than we can. Contact us as soon as you see him. Over.
Hendricks. We just spotted him about 22,000 feet. This is 019. Closing in. Over. This is Hendricks. Any change in his condition? Over. No, sir. None I can see. It's about seven minutes now since we've spotted him. Altitude only 8,000. Still no change. Hey, just a minute. Yeah, he's moving. He is... He's moving. He, he, he's made it, Hank. He made it. End of project. End of test. The end of a journey. Report and recommendations to follow. Dr. Roberts is now well aware what the sledgehammer is. He knows because it almost killed him. The impact on a man of a parachute opening under the conditions of his jump was equivalent to 32 gravities, 32 times the man's own weight. With full equipment, it amounted to some 6,500 pounds. This sudden compression of the chest by the 32 gravities and by the parachute harness forces almost all the oxygen from the lungs and produces first anoxia and then complete unconsciousness. This Dr. Roberts proved and a good many other things besides. He proved that three principal benefits are achieved when a pilot falls free and his parachute is not opened immediately. First, the free fall reduces the gravity force experienced in chute openings at high altitudes. Second, the free fall minimizes time exposure to low oxygen pressure atmosphere, thus reducing the possibility of anoxia, today known as hypoxia. Third, the free fall reduces the time which the body is exposed to the extremely cold temperatures of the substratosphere. He proved it was necessary to develop parachutes which would open automatically in case of unconsciousness. The experiment also made it clear it was necessary to develop a canopy to eliminate the dangerous oscillation or swinging motion he had experienced. He also proved that present emergency oxygen bottles together with the newly developed mask fittings would sustain life during the long descent, providing the drop did not start above 50,000 feet and providing the man falls free to below 20,000 feet. And most importantly, in the long 24 minutes from his bailout to the moment he reached the ground, Dr. Roberts proved his initial theory, a theory he could now present as a fact to the officers and men of the United States Air Forces. Don't jump unless you have to. And if you have to, follow instructions and you'll make it. The Project Dramatized was actually conducted and the parachute jump involved was executed by William R. Lovelace II, M.D. of Albuquerque, New Mexico. For his great contribution to the field of aviation, he received the Distinguished Flying Cross. To Dr. Lovelace and to his many co-workers, Medic wishes to express the gratitude and admiration of a grateful nation.